So I, I think Brother Fahad's coming. And uh, inshallah, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help me remember one of the key things that she has said. That is that we could not have been destroyed from without. We could not have been conquered from without if we had not destroyed that which is within. I think that these are deep words that we need to reflect upon and that we need to go back within ourselves and rebuild that which is within ourselves. Sister Amina Silmi, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us that we can benefit uh, from the clear and lucid uh, advices that you have given to us. Inshallah. do that which you do, that is to promote effective da'wah um, and the why, what reason should be given to a non-Muslim to convert to Islam? <clears throat> okay, doing da'wah effectively sometimes can be very complicated. Because a lot of people want to jump in there and explain to the non-Muslim everything that's wrong about what they're doing and why they shouldn't believe what they believe and why, you know, tell them how haram they are. When actually, if we study the sunnah, you'll find a much better way of doing da'wah. And that is by living Islam. Let them learn Islam through your conduct and the way that you are in every aspect of your life. Be sure that you greet everyone with a smiling countenance as is required in Islam. Be sure that you are treating people with compassion, kindness, and consideration. Be sure that you are being in the right way with your children, with your wife, with your husband. Be sure that you are conducting your affairs in the proper way, that you are dressed properly that you are behaving properly. Be sure that you have the knowledge to answer any question they bring to you. And from there, shweya, shweya, slowly, slowly. Now as an old saying, I heard when I was young that I never understood until after I got involved in Dawa. The hungry man is always eager to eat. Think about it. The hungry man is always eager to eat. You give them a little bit at a time. If they ask about hijab, don't tell them why we pray five times a day. Answer the question about hijab and let it go. If they ask a question about another thing, answer it and let it go. They want a short answer, they don't want a two-hour tirade. But always remember, again, studying the sona and the way you approach them with kindness, with humor where it's appropriate, with patience and tolerance. Remember that if you attack, they will defend. And when they defend, they cannot hear. So don't bother to attack them. Don't point out what they're doing wrong. Give them the truth and give them time to accept it. Becoming a Muslim after living your life as something else is not an easy decision to make. I know, I made it. And it was not an easy decision to make. It's scary. You have no idea 
how terrifying it is to someone to think that possibly they have been on the wrong path their whole life. And not only to think that, but to live in fear that if they go to the right path, their families and friends may reject them. It's a very serious thing. So don't push them. Give them a chance. Give yourself a chance. And let it come slowly. And what was the other half of that? with American Indians, and if so, can you decide, uh, describe the experience? Um, see, when, when I set out to do Dawa, that's okay, he's all right, let him go. He can come up here and talk, I, I'm cool with it, okay? <laughs> Look, when, when I go out to do Dawa, I, I don't set out to do Dawa. I do not set out to convert anyone to Islam. But every human being that I meet, no matter who they are, is going to be introduced to Islam. Not by me even saying the word Islam, Allah, Muslim, or anything else. They will be introduced to Islam through my presence and the way that I will conduct myself. I don't set out to do dawah with a particular group of people. That does not mean you know, I mean, I haven't gone out to Native Americans to try and bring them to Islam. However, quite a few have come to Islam. And it hasn't been a hard journey for them if they are the same heritage that I am from because the first wave of Islam in North America came through the Cherokee. Islam was in North America in the year 850 brought here by Senegalese sailors. The second wave of Islam came with the slave trade, but the first Muslims in, in North America were the Cherokees. I happen to be one. And many of our traditions and many of the things that we do are still very much in line with Islam. And so for many of my people, we're finding, oh, now I know why we did that. Now I understand why we did, oh, okay, that makes sense now. So we're refinding the Islam and, and many of the Cherokee people are coming very excitedly as they rediscover the roots of what we have been doing as just cultural practices and discovering what they really are. But I, I don't set out to convert any group of people, so I can't tell you how to reach a particular group of people. I reach people one person at a time. And I think it's the only way to go. It's one person at a time, one on one. <coughs> Can you please give your advice on exactly how to make parents understand that it is permissible to choose one's own husband and wife, especially parents who are firm believers in the concept of arranged marriage? How can this be done without creating discord or disappointment? How does one approach one's parents? I wish I had an answer for this. This is one of the things that's breaking my heart. Because I see the problems that are happening. And I don't know that there's anything you can do to change your parents' ways and their attitudes. Because no matter how much evidence you will give them to show them that they are wrong, they will not change from their cultural ways. And unfortunately, the best I can do is to tell you, don't do it to your children. You can show in Hadith and you can show in Quran that the child has the right to say that they do not want to marry someone or that they want to marry someone. They have that right. That does not mean that your parents will change where they stand on it by any means because the cultural practice is too strong. And I have no answer, no way to solve the dilemma except for beg you to not do it to your own children, to remember yourself and not do it to your own children. We live in times of enormous ignorance amongst Muslims. Enormous ignorance. I'm sorry, that's the best I can do for you. Just say, don't do it to your own children. You can try to show them Quran and Hadith. 
but most of the parents I've tried to talk to won't accept it because it's not their cultural practice. Can you please comment on the dilemma faced by our younger women? In high schools, they are bombarded by messages to be worldly, physically perfect, etc. As well, they are forced to interact with male students in group work. How should they feel strong at a time they are most vulnerable? Actually, you know, the guys are going through a lot too. Um, they're not as, as apparent to the other people because they don't dress properly. I mean, some of them wear bathing suits and tight jeans, you know. Well, no, I've seen them do it. But, you know, they go through a lot. Of, they have to make choices all the time. They have to make choices if they're going out for athletic events, for, for any kind of sport. Are they going to wear the clothing that is required by the school, or are they going to fight the school? So they have to fight too. The girls have the additional burden because they're picked on a great deal. Okay? I mean, we have our scarves tugged on and pulled. We're called ragheads. I mean, all kinds of different things. And I think a lot of parents really are not aware of the pressures that their junior high and high school girls are facing. Um, Teachers do not trust children who will not look them in the eye. And yet, in the Islamic culture, it's not acceptable to look someone of the opposite sex in the eye. As a Native American, it's not acceptable in my culture either. Only as a Native American, it goes even deeper that we don't, a child is not allowed to look an adult in the eye. It's forbidden. And sometimes you have to be there to go and talk to the teachers. You may need to conduct seminars and training programs for teachers in your area to acquaint them with the special needs of your children. But you must be involved in a positive way with the school and in support of your child. You must be your child's advocate. You must know your child's right. And there are legal rights that your child has, and you have to be there to support them. If you don't think you can do it, you find someone who can, but don't leave your child without support. The kids need to learn to cling together, to come together as much as they can, and to find also ways of finding other people to stand up for them if your parents won't do it. I admire so much our Muslim youth because they not only suffer the persecution in the school from the people who do not understand Islam and Muslims, they suffer the persecution in their homes and in their families by the families who do not and will not accept the pressures and tragedies of their lives in the real world that they live in here. Is there a couple of questions on the same? <laughs> There's a couple of questions on the same uh, theme. Uh, according to Islam, can women work outside the home if they have young children and even if their husband's working? So they leave the work and so they leave the children with the babysitter. Is that all right? Okay. Um, a woman is allowed to own a business, to conduct her business affairs, and cannot be prevented from whatever is necessary for her to own, operate, conduct her own business affairs um, in any way. All right? Uh, now, it's... <laughs> there, in Islam, we're supposed to have extended families, all right? We, we have special problems here because we don't have the extended families and people are afraid of polygamy and so they have no choice but to leave their children with strangers in daycare centers and other things like this. I don't know that it is forbidden, but I do know that on the day of judgment, 
You will answer to Allah for all of the negative things your child will learn while in the care of another person. You will answer on the day of judgment for the insecurity that your child develops because the parent was not there to love them and hold them and comfort them and encourage them and help them to develop as full human beings. You will answer to Allah for all of the deficiencies that will develop in your child because your child has to depend on himself or herself more than on the parent who wasn't there. And brothers, you will answer to Allah if you are not there for your children in the same way. Now I do know parents where both are going to school and studying and they take different shifts. So when he's in class, she's at home. When she's in class, he's at home. So the children are never left with a babysitter. And it works well. They're doing all right. They're getting their degrees, which is important to them both. But the child can never be neglected. And the child needs to parents involved in their upbringing. It is not solely the responsibility of the mother. The father is supposed to be there hugging, loving, kissing, changing, washing, putting to bed, reading stories, teaching, whatever. It's a father's responsibility to be a parent as much as the mother's. Um, there's a hadith which says on the day of judgment more women will be in the hellfire. Can you explain this? <laughs> um, yeah, there, there, that hadith is there. You know, I'm not going to deny it because that hadith is there. And there are more women in the world than there are men. You know, I mean, there are a lot more women than there are men on the earth. There will probably be that ratio in, in hell as well. <laughs> you know, Allah gives us a lot of breaks. You know, heaven's put at the, the feet of the mother, but if the mother wants to, you know, not do what's supposed to be done, she doesn't get to heaven just by virtue of having children. And women... Too often, thank you very much, sweethearts. Women too often, <laughs> I'm going to make some enemies here, but I have a reputation for not pulling punches, so sorry, ladies, if I offend you right now, I'm not sorry. I'm going to do it. Women seem to love to spend time complaining about how bad their lives are. Rather than studying Quran or playing with children or teaching children or being joyful and being alive, women like to sit around and talk about, oh, this was not how I planned my life to be. If only my husband had done this, then we would have this. Women seem to, and I'm a woman, okay? But women seem more inclined to complain because things aren't the way they want them to be. They won't do anything to change it. They just like to complain. Women seem more inclined to sit around and um, chew the flesh of their sisters, if you will, rather than occupy themselves in, in activities and charity work and whatever, something that would be of benefit to society. They like to gather around and, did you know that so-and-so did this and that? 
Okay? I wish it wasn't this way, but I have to face the reality of what I see every day. And tell the women want to change the way they're doing things. Their future looks pretty bleak to me. What should the wife do if her husband doesn't allow his children to go to their mother's, brother's or other relative's house? To their mother's, brother's or mm -hmm. relatives? Oh, to their mother's brother. Okay. Well, you know, we have issues of where the husband does have the final say on things. And um, we face the reality that a lot of our brothers um, don't mind facing a law and explaining to a law why they would break the ties of family. And since the breaking of, of bonds of family is one of the worst things that we can do, um, you know, the, this brother, whoever he is, you know, I feel sorry for him, but he seems not to be afraid of a law in the least bit if he's trying to do something that would cause a, a breaking in the bonds of family. Now, I also have sometimes people will talk about, well, you know, but my wife's family is not Muslim. And they, you know, they don't want their wife to associate with her own parents because they're not Muslim and things like this. I have to warn you, even that is forbidden. Okay? Whether they are Muslim or not, the family ties can not be broken. And the wing of mercy will be lowered to the parents no matter what their religious belief is. The only thing you can do is to try and show them in Quran, show them in Hadith, and encourage in a kind and polite way. It doesn't help to yell and scream and throw things or even to cry and stomp your feet or threaten or anything like that. But a lot of times honey will work where fire doesn't. And so I advise you to try a little bit of honey and a little bit of knowledge to try and educate him. And brothers, lots of luck on the Day of Judgment. There are several questions around this theme. Uh, I'll read one of the questions. I have these Western friends who are always picking on the fact that in the eyewitness case, uh, two women are needed as to one man. I say it's only on financial matters where women, due to their different roles, may not be as well versed in money matters as, in, as men are. But they say to me, what about Benazir Bhutto, for example? Can you help me answering them? Uh, you know, I, I, I wish that I, I were more knowledgeable. I really do. Um, this is one of the points that is sometimes the hardest to explain because people will pick on anything and everything as a point to argue on when they just want to argue and you're not going to be able to necessarily convince them of anything. Uh, you need to remind them, yes indeed, it is only on matter of, of economics, on money, that it requires two women to one man so the man cannot pre put pressure on his wife and so that unhappiness wouldn't be generated as easily. So it's a protection for the woman and a protection for the marriage that he can't push his wife because he has to find another woman as well. All right? You can also remind them that there is another time in the Quran where a woman's witness is stronger than a man's witness. And even if a man says one thing, if the woman says contrary, the woman's voice is the one that is supposed to be heard. So there's balances all around. And, and in Islam, all rights are not the same. And same is not necessarily equitable. But in Islam, all things are equitable. Each right is balanced by an obligation. 
And this is the thing that makes Islam different, is that each right is balanced by an obligation. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, the Adan will be sounding soon, so if we can prepare for Isha, inshallah, and then if you come back, there'll be some dessert and some time for some more questions. Thanks. I've got 60 questions up here. I cannot possibly deal with them. All right? I'm, I'm going to try and deal with the ones that I think are more urgent. The others, if you want a written response from me, then you can leave your address and stuff and I will do the best I can as far as answering them and send them to you. If yours is not dealt with, I'm sorry. And getting angry at her is not going to get an answer for you. All right? I will answer as many as I can, but don't take it out on Kathleen again. Okay. Where are we at? Okay, so uh, there's a couple of questions on this theme. Uh, what do you think the brothers can do in order to be identified as Muslims? What is the proper Islamic clothing for the Muslim brothers? Oh yes, I forgot to talk about Islamic dress for men, didn't I? Okay, sorry about that. You guys are not getting off scot-free. There is an appropriate dress for the Muslim women, hijab for men as well as hijab for, for women, all right? Now most of you should know I have seen a couple who seem to have forgotten, all right? Men are not allowed to wear tight-fitting pants. It's forbidden. So don't do it. Men are not to wear any clothing that reveals their shape and form. They are to be modest. A man is not to wear a shirt and then button it down, unbutton it to his waist to show his hairy or non-hairy chest. It's not acceptable. Men, men are not supposed to be wearing swimming trunks unless they cover the aura. Okay? Knee to navel, loose fitting, does not cling either in the water or out of the water. Those little bicycle shorts that go down to the knee but are so tight that it doesn't look like you have anything on from behind, not acceptable. All kinds of things that the brothers are doing, not acceptable and actually you need to look at finding better ways to be recognized for who and what you are you are Muslim men men of dignity men of value men of worth you do need not need to dress in ways to draw attention to yourselves any more than the women to I mean sexual attention you should always be clean, neat, well-dressed to the best of your ability. You should not smell bad. Please, you should not smell bad. Your hair should be clean and combed, and your beards the same. There are requirements for men as well as women. Okay, what is uh, proper Islamic clothing to identify Muslim brothers? This is brothers too, okay? What can brothers do? Huh. Well, I just told it, that's it, finished. There's quite a few questions about the hijab, so I'll sort of try to summarize and give you a few. Um, what about hijab recovering the face? How do you answer when people say um, the hijab has just cultural roots and therefore it's not a command from Allah? So if I feel comfortable being Muslim but don't want to cover with the hijab, then that's okay. Um, um, how do you narrow the gap between? How do you narrow the gap between a Muslim who is not wearing hijab and a Muslim who is wearing hijab? No, read this one too. Read this one too. <laughs> Sister Amina Asumi, your dress reminds me of the Christian nuns. Can you recommend a dress for Muslim women which can be recognized as totally Muslim or Islamic? Hey, 
whoever wrote this, you need to study the history of the Catholic Church, okay? Nuns didn't come into existence until like 13th, 14th century. And isn't it amazing that the Catholic Church, when they looked for what would be the appropriate dress for the most pious women in their religion, turned to the Muslim women for their example. We did not copy the nuns, babies. They copied us. Okay? Hijab is not a cultural issue. Hijab is an issue between you and Allah. That's an issue between you and Allah, and you will answer to Allah if you refuse to wear it. But I don't want you to wear it for social acceptance. I don't want you to wear it because it makes someone else happy. I want you to wear it because you know it's the right thing to do. But if you refuse to accept the knowledge that will show you this, remember on the day of judgment you will answer to Allah for every day that you have refused. Which books in English do you recommend for youths and for teenagers? And uh, one more. You said you said that we should go to China to seek knowledge. Is it only Quranic knowledge or any knowledge? Okay, we must seek knowledge, okay? We must seek all knowledge. But no knowledge is worth anything if it does not have Quran, okay? All knowledge is of value. But you do not know how to use the knowledge unless you have the basis in Islam. As far as the books to read, my first recommendation, Quran. And if you do not know Arabic, read it in the language that you understand. It is not going to help you to memorize Quran in Arabic if that is not your language. You need to know the meaning. The magic is not in the sound. The magic is in the knowledge that is contained. And you must obtain that in the language that you understand. It is beautiful to have your children memorize Quran in Arabic. It's wonderful. I wish all children would, but I wish they would learn what the Quran says first. Because that is what's going to help them. Quran first. In the language they understand. Second, Sahih Bukhari. Third, Sahih Muslim. And if you can get through that much, you're going to have a real good, solid knowledge. What do we do if some imams in some mosques preach that women are evil, that women was created from Adam's rib and crooked, you can't straighten it? One, do we walk out of the mosque? <laughs> or do we just listen to him patiently and accept his preaching? And when men die and go to heaven, they are expected to be rewarded with milk and honey and fair maidens. What do women expect in heaven? Milk and honey and fair men. Um, okay, it doesn't do any good to make a scene in the masjid. Okay, should you listen to it? You can listen to it and ask Allah to forgive him. Listen to it and ask Allah to give him knowledge. Listen to it, ask Allah to give him wisdom. He's probably not going to listen to you if he's saying this stuff, he already thinks that you're not of value, so he's not going to listen to you trying to correct him, okay? He's not going to listen to it. And if his understanding of, of Hadith is as weak as the way he's trying to use that, ask Allah to forgive him. Uh, is it haram to wear makeup? Yes. I'm sorry, I can't give you permission to wear makeup. If you want to wear makeup at home with your husband, alhamdulillah, Allahu akbar, because we are to make ourselves beautiful for our husbands. We are not supposed to make ourselves beautiful for other people, only for our husbands. And you can't make wudu with makeup on. Uh, 
I am a female Muslim in Islam. I have a few good non-Muslim friends. My parents always stress on me to have more Muslim friends, but what if my Muslim friends don't abide by Islamic law and are worse than my European friends? Would it be better that if I stick with just a few good friends who are non-Muslim? Okay, what we're advised to do is not to take the advice of non-Muslims and not to take the non-Muslim as our, our confidant, our one that we turn to with all of our problems and everything. To have acquaintances and friends who are non-Muslim is perfectly acceptable. Uh, because a child has a Muslim parent does not mean the child is living by Islam. And many of them are just as bad as any of the others. Just because the child's parents are non-Muslim do not make the children evil. And many of these young people end up coming to Islam through contact with your children. You know, alhamdulillah, my youngest is only 15. But there's always already 27 people who come to Islam through going to school with him. Um, we're doing good. We're doing okay. Um, there's a few here around a similar issue. The questions are sort of different. I'll read them all and then you can think. Um, how should the period of Vidat be observed by Muslim women? In many societies, women are confined to their homes for four months and ten days after the death of their husbands, leading to great mental hardship. Your speech is so Islamic, but in reality, particularly in India and Pakistan, they treat women as slaves. They believe man has total control over women. What can we do about that? Sister Amina, assalamu alaikum. You rightly said about 20 million sisters who are deprived of social status and suffer from physical and mental health. What is the practical way to go about this problem and earn the pleasure of Allah? Okay, um, it's really true that in many places, you know, societies, not Islam, but societies and cultures are oppressing not only women, but children and, and other members of the human race as well. We cannot change the whole world, but we can change the environment in which we are. We can change the community in which we are. We can see that in the community in which we live, that these practices are not continued. And that through all of us within the one community, then inshallah, we can spread back into others. Um, I, I, I've been to Pakistan, so I, I know, okay? I'm fighting the a law there because it's illegal. It's, it's totally wrong, all right? Um, the, the period of it that does not mean that you have to be locked in your house, okay? It means that you should have limited uh, contact and exposure with men who are going to soon be marriageable to you, all right? So you're supposed to avoid that. Even in that, you are allowed to conduct your business affairs. Even in that, you're allowed to go to the masjid. Okay? Even in that, you're allowed to do a lot of different things. But when you are in that, you should not look at, speak to, or have any kind of dealings with a man who will become marriageable to you. And you should always be in the company of a mahram. Is it a wife's duty as a Muslim to cook, clean, and pick up after her husband? Wait, 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 no, wait, no, wait, I'm going to finish that one first. Okay, and, and, excuse me, wait. And it is the man's responsibility to cook, clean, and pick up after his wife. Okay. So the second part of that question is, uh, I know that we are to obey our husband in things Islamic. If he tells us to do these things, that we just mentioned. Do we have to do it and please him? Uh, there's a second one that's kind of related. Wives are not allowed to refuse their husband when they come to them. What about vice versa? Vice versa is true. A man is not allowed to refuse his wife any more than, than she's supposed to refuse him. Okay? And it can create more of a hardship on a man than it can a woman. So, yeah, it's... It's equitable there. You have the right to ask for it. If you ask, he has to provide. Okay. Um, some people are going crazy here. That's okay. 
Okay, about uh, the cleaning and picking up and so forth. All right. Actually, no, it's not her obligation or responsibility Islamically to do any of that. When Aisha was asked what the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, did in his home, she responded that he cleaned, he cooked, and he mended his own sandals. That was the Prophet of Allah. Okay, you guys aren't marrying servants. You're marrying beautiful companions. She is your garment, not your carpet. Okay? Her obligation is towards the children. She has an obligation in regards to the children. But as far as the cooking and the cleaning and the stuff like this, this is not her sole responsibility. The example was set forward by one who is better than any of you. If he could cook and clean and mend his own sandals, you should be able to cook and clean and wash your own clothes. Okay, there's a few around marriage. Um, Assalamu alaikum, sister, I enjoyed your lecture very much. I wanted to know if we men are allowed to marry non-Muslim women when there are Muslim women. Can we have a Muslim wife and also take a non-Muslim wife? Let, let me read them all and then you can... You can't take all of them okay. in that way, okay? I need to respond to, to, to this one here right, anyway. Okay. Yes, it is permissible for you to marry a woman who is from the people of the book, okay? Um, you can marry them. You cannot require them to practice Islam. You, in marrying them, cannot assure that your children will have teaching of Islam no matter what you do. You know, so you're asking for some problems. When you do it, you need to consider what you're looking at. I see so many instances where brothers have married non-Muslims believing that they were going to bring them to Islam. They failed. They end up in divorce. The children are given to the non-Muslim parent, and the children are being raised to hate Islam. And you need to consider this, okay? In planning who you're going to marry, what's the first thing you're supposed to look at is the religious nature of the woman. The religious nature of the woman. That's the first thing you need to look at. You are allowed, but it is not recommended. Very high on the list. Can you have a non-Muslim woman and a Muslim woman as wives at the same time? You can have it. But I'll bet you anything, the non-Muslim woman's going to have you in jail real quick. Since marriage is a sunnah and not a fad, do you think it's okay for a woman to choose not to marry? I prefer not to as I can take care of myself. Finding the right person, settling down and staying married seems to be more difficult than it ought to be. And there's another one that's kind of related. I usually attend Islamic conferences and all kinds of gatherings and I have noticed that there are many Muslim sisters who are unmarried just like me and maybe hoping to meet a Muslim brother for a marriage. But how do we make the approach? Where do we begin? To, is there a way we can make a match in the proper way? All brothers who are not married, please stand up. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> issue first, all right, um, that there are many reasons for getting married, all right? Now, if you genuinely, if you genuinely never experience the need of a man, never have need for that comfort and that companionship that's provided by the, your beautiful garment, then you are not obliged to get married, okay? 
but it is highly recommended because human nature is such, excuse me, <coughs> dependent. And we do need each other. Marriage is the proper way, and marriage is the best way. And especially when you're young, especially when you're young, when you get to be like me and you're well over half a century of years, marriage is not that vitally important anymore. <laughs> but I strongly recommend that any of the young sisters don't make a decision that you're not going to get married. Be careful, okay? Be careful. <coughs> Perspective, husbands and wives is through involvement in um, Islamic organizations and Islamic functions. And I don't mean just going to them. I mean getting involved in planning them, implementing them. Get involved, and you have a great newspaper up here. Get involved in helping to make this little newspaper happen. There's a Muslim voice, okay? Fabulous done by the young people. Get involved in, in any of the activities. Get involved with MENA. Get involved with MSA. Get involved. And then inshallah, then it, it becomes much easier to start finding people who are appropriate to be getting married to. Most important is to remember to be patient. Okay? Remember to be patient. There's someone out there for everyone. And that someone will be there when the time is right. It may be that right now you're really not ready. And so Allah may be saving it a little bit for you until you're really ready. And we have to quit. Yeah. I know. Um, I've been asked to wrap up the questions, and I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. We had so many. I think you did a pretty good job. And our sister Mina's voice is starting to go on her, as you can hear. So we do apologize for anyone who didn't have their question answered. And perhaps they can put it in writing or speak to the sister tomorrow, if you're a woman, at the sister's gathering, inshallah. And sister Amina seems to come to Toronto quite often, so I guess there'll be other times, inshallah. Sorry, Brother Fahad will come. Thanks.